Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. As always, I will remind you to uh, sign the attendance record uh, at the back of the auditorium where Dr. Gerbrock is, and uh, also uh, request that you fill out the evaluations and give us any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Tim Hansen. Dr. Hansen is a dermatologist and a Mohs surgeon. Uh, he did his uh, dermatology residency at uh, uh, Penn State and then uh, did his uh, fellowship at MD Anderson. And uh, he kindly has accepted our invitation today to uh, shower us with some dermatology pearls. And so uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tim Hansen. Thank you. Um, I was telling Dr. Hallberg it's been probably since my residency since I've given a talk like this, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and even though I primarily practice most surgery, I one thing that attracted me to dermatology was the variety that is offered in all the things you can do within the field of dermatology. So I still do practice general dermatology one day um, a week seeing all kinds of patients. Um, and as I was approaching what to talk about, you hear about pearls a lot. I'm hoping to hone in on things that I've recognized as potential practice gaps between dermatologists and other uh, physicians. And hopefully I can close some of those practice gaps, give you some diamonds, if you will, to, uh, to, to help you recognize things that um, may otherwise be more confusing. Um, I don't have any conflicts to dis disclose. I'll see if I can get the technology to work. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna start by talking about how to describe skin findings. Um, whenever you consult a dermatologist, I will admit that if you use certain terms that are non-specific, sometimes we chuckle in the back of our minds or whatever. If, uh, and so hopefully I can give you some key descriptors that actually it can be quite helpful if you describe things in our vernacular in dermatology. I joke with students who rotate with me and whatnot that we like our adjectives in dermatology. So a lot of adjectives going on. Um, I'll also describe some inpatient cases, some more serious cases that have skin manifestations. Um, as well as some more routine outpatient type of cases. Um, I will talk uh, mostly about uh, systemic diseases that have skin findings, but I will also talk about um, skin only conditions, um, which we see a lot of. And then I'll briefly review some of the treatment of most common diseases. Uh, I'm gonna start off actually pretty slow and then I'm gonna kind of ramp up and how fast I'm going through things. So. Um, hopefully we can get a good momentum going. I have to point this a certain way to get it to advance. I'm just going to use the computer. All right. Um, the one conflict of interest that I will describe is the the chair of the department I trained at is Dr. Marks, James G. Marks, and the current chair, actually, he's retired, is, is now Jeffrey Miller. They wrote this wonderful book. If you're looking for a good general dermatology reference that's accessible for a primary care or, or non-dermatology specialist, this would be a good one. It's in its sixth edition now. I used my old fourth edition that I had from their time, but um, it's a good, it's a good uh, reference for you. So real quickly on the descriptors, when things are a bump coming up out of the skin, we refer to them as papules. You can kind of see the histology, what it would look like um, underneath afterwards. Okay. Um, whereas if it's flat, but there's an obvious lesion or discoloration difference between the surrounding skin, we call it a macule. So papules and macules, if they get bigger, the papules become plaques. So bigger than one centimeter, we generally say it's not a papule anymore. Now it's a plaque. Um, whereas if a macule gets bigger, it becomes a patch. Um, so papule help and plaque helps us know the size of what we're looking at. And macule and patch also is a more of a size issue. Um, 
Then you can get into nodules, which rather than being like within the skin, they seem to be deeper into the skin and even below the skin, you start thinking of the descriptor of a nodule. So if it seems like it's a deeper process, not just skin deep, then we're looking at nodules. Um, and cysts would also be in that nodule category, but when you say cysts, you think it's a cyst. When it's a nodule, it could be a cyst, it could be some tumor or some other kind of thing. Then we have vesicles or bullae. Vesicles are just small blisters. Bullae are big blisters. Usually bullae um, are deeper blisters that have more of a tense fluid-filled nature. Vesicles oftentimes, uh, what you see is actually an erosion because the roof of the vesicle has come off, and so you see little what used to be vesicles. And then you have pustules, which are kind of like vesicles, but they're filled with neutrophils, and that exhibits as a white pus type of material. And I mentioned this term erosion. So when vesicles have the top layer of the skin come off of them, we refer to it as an erosion. So a very superficial denuded layer of skin, um, whereas an ulceration would be a full thickness um, loss of skin of various depths. And then you have fissures, which we often see on acral surfaces like the hands or feet. Um, and they're more of a, a linear cracking of that stratum corneum, which is very thick in those areas. And so it presents as a fissure. Then instead of hives, we like to use the term wheel, um, but that's more, or urticaria. Um, so that's more of a dermal swelling, um, as you can kind of see in, the, in the, the histology down below. So you just get some fluid pushing the skin up a little bit. That is, would be a wheel. And telangiectasias is how we describe the superficial blood vessels that you can often see whether it's on the face or the lower legs, more commonly associated with varicose veins or rosacea. And then some final descriptors that I'll talk about is instead of scabbing, we use the term crusting. Um, so if it's a crusted, and sometimes we'll combine things. So in this mouth here, we would call it uh, cr crusted erosions is oftentimes how I would refer to that. Um, but crusting is another term we use when there's scabbing involved. Um, scaling um, can happen on patches, can happen on plaques, but it's good to know if something's scaling or not. That helps us put something in a category. Um, in dermatology, we're putting things in differential, differential diagnoses, and scaling actually can put it in one category versus the other. Same with these other descriptors. That's why we use them. It helps us narrow down what may be going on. And then finally, lichenification um, is kind of the thickening of skin that happens often with chronic rubbing or scratching. Um, and the reason the term lichenification is used is because like lichens on rocks or, uh, or wood, that type of a thing, they kind of have that crackly appearance um, that happens whenever the skin gets thickened from that chronic trauma. So I'm going to start once again kind of slowly, and I'm going to delve more into a case. Um, and I'm just going to show you a presentation. I'm going to give you a case presentation. So bear with me as I read through this, and I'm going to ask you to decide what you think is going on as I describe this. So a 73-year-old woman presented to the emergency room with a two-week history of a neck lump and a four-day history of fever, vomiting, and diarrhea. Her medical history revealed hypoparathyroidism and spinal stenosis. Medications were aspirin, thyroid medicine, um, simvastatin, losartan, allopurinol, and indapamide. Prior to presenting to the hospital, she had taken two doses of clarithromycin, followed by five days of penicillin. So she had, and the patient lived with her son. There was no history of exposure to tuberculosis or recent travel. She smoked 20 cigarettes a day. Initial recorded temperature in the ED was 101.3. Examination removed a, uh, revealed a smooth, tender, five by five centimeter lump in the submandibular region. Several small lumps were noted in the upper outer quadrant of the left breast. Admission blood tests were uh, normal white blood count, with normal differential, elevated CRP, and de decreased GFR with normal LFTs. So what are you thinking or what would you do at this point? I don't know how often in grand rounds you have the interactive thing. But this is one time I'll see if you can throw out something that you're thinking based on that presentation. Drug rash, that's a good thought. You're telegraphed. <laughs> a lot of these signs you see with infections too, right? So she has an elevated 
temperature, fever. She's got big swollen nodes, it seems, maybe even a submandibular abscess or something like that. So she was actually admitted with the presumption of infection, but she had had a lot of exposures to medications. So my point is going to be always keep drug reaction on your differential and particular more serious types of drug reactions. Um, so an ultrasound revealed multiple reactive nodes, which were thought to be due to an infection. Fevers continued, and then you get this non-paritic morbilliform rash uh, um, on the lower limbs and then involving the trunk and the upper limbs. They converted the antibiotics to IV antibiotics. Things were not getting better. And then finally, they transferred the patient to an infectious disease unit and sought a dermatologic opinion. Um, she continued to develop worsening fever, uh, had difficulty breathing, those types of things. She developed this around her mouth, um, which hopefully when you see this around the mouth, drug rash goes up on your differential. Um, and oftentimes when we see this rash, we actually think of a certain drug rash called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which I'll talk about. But in this case, this kind of a rash with crusting around the lips is also seen in this other condition. Um, and that condition is called DRESS syndrome or drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Um, and this is in that category of severe drug reactions. Probably the more popular drug reaction that's severe is Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis or TEN. But DRESS um, is equally, in my opinion, serious as far as um, needing to recognize it. And the gap that I would like to narrow with bringing this to your attention is there's been multiple occasions during my residency training where we were consulted in the hospital for a patient being treated for sepsis. And on consultation, we were able to diagnose DRESS syndrome. And, and that was important because they needed to shift their treatment paradigm and actually give these patients steroids and withdraw antibiotics as opposed to continue antibiotics and not give steroids. So, um, and sometimes there was a back and forth in trying to convince the, the consulting team that this is what needed to happen. So hopefully this can be on your differentials if that ever comes up when sepsis doesn't quite seem to be responding as you expected, especially. Um, so dress usually occurs two to three, two weeks to three months after a drug intake. Um, as the name implies, eosin eosinophilia is involved. So your eosinophil count on the white blood count is a key indicator that if you see that above uh, 1,000, that you want to be concerned about it. And also one thing, it's a subtle clue, but if you have facial edema and edema in general um, of the extremities, it's probably best if you catch that before they've been given a lot of fluids because then that can confound things as to what the edema is from. But if, especially facial edema and peripheral edema is uh, pretty characteristic and seen in, I'd say, virtually all of these patients. Um, lymphadenopathy is very common and visceral, visceral involvement is very common. Uh, we often see liver function tests going up and up as time goes on. So that's the other clue. If you see LFTs, increasing in addition to the eosinophilia, in addition to have the, having this drug rash, uh, or this, I call it a drug rash, in addition to have this, uh, we call it a morbilliform eruption, maculopapular and morbilliform are equivalent terms in dermatology. So um, you also see it with things like viral exanthem. So it's not specific, but if you have that kind of a skin rash plus these other things, we want to think about dress syndrome. Um, the other important thing to uh, consider is with visceral involvement, it is very commonly associated with um, delayed, uh, auto, almost autoimmune type conditions, especially with the thyroid. So another pearl or diamond that I would give is you need to check the TSH for up to two years. Usually we say three to six months at least, three and six months, check the TSH to make sure it's not uh, changing because uh, delayed thyroid issues are very common when someone has experienced stress syndrome. Um, and then it's also important to not give short courses of steroids. It needs to actually be tapered over a, a three-month period usually. 
Um, so you start at about one to one and a half milligrams per kilogram and taper it slowly over about three months. And then you're checking thyroids at three months, six months um, to, to look for that. All right. And then as with any drug reaction, trying to highlight the offending medication is a challenge, but also important and withdrawing that medication so that it, that the reaction can subside. Um, typically with drug reactions, um, Anticonvulsants are very uh, common offenders, so uh, anti-epileptic drugs. Um, antibiotics are also very commonly implicated, um, and allopurinol is another common offender. So those would be uh, key drugs to look for to begin with. Um, there are case reports of a lot of other medications doing it, though, so it's, it's not always cut and dry. But if you see one of those, that's a good place to start. So the difference between DRESS syndrome and Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis is primarily the mucosal involvement. So interestingly enough, this lady on the, the left here, we saw in the hospital and looked like this. Um, but as we were able to identify things and remove the offending drug, um, she actually was off the ventilator and looking like a completely different person in like a week or two later. Um, so we were able to catch it before it developed into TEN, um, which would require more long-term treatment in a burn unit. Um, the things to think about with SJS or TEN, Stephen Johnson syndrome is defined as 10% or less of body surface area involved with these blistering, which you can kind of see down here on her neck the erosions on the skin and the, the bullet of the skin, 10% um, or less. And then there's an overlap between 10 and 30%. Once you reach 30% or more, it's called toxic, toxic epidermal necrolysis. And those patients need to be transferred to a burn unit as soon as possible and managed as a uh, burn patient. Um, mucosal involvement, back to that, is a hallmark of this as well. So conjunctivitis, con conjunctivitis and mucositis along with all these erosions and crusting in mucosal surfaces. And don't forget to check the groin area too. Um, if there's any other point I can drive home is please look at the skin whenever you're examining a patient too. It can give you some good clues to what's going on. And even in the covered areas, which you may not typically uncover. Um, so this is another severe drug reaction where re withdrawing the offending medication and the list of medications is very similar. Um, is important to recognize. The final drug reaction that I'll review, it's less serious. It's called, we call it AGEP, or acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis. Um, so going back to the morphology, you can see that these almost blister-like areas filled with white pus, we call them pustules. They're filled with neutrophils. If you did a biopsy of this, it would show a lot of neutrophils just in the surface of the skin. Um, it's another drug reaction, withdrawing the offending medication, the skin will kind of peel off, resurface. It's not a deep process, so we don't worry as much like the TEN for burn type stuff. This is more of a superficial process, so everything will flake off and the rash will get better without um, significant sequelae, typically. So that that's the drug reaction side of things. I'm going to shift gears. So we see this morbilliform or maculopapular rash in a patient. And oftentimes we're consulted as dermatologists on the oncology unit, somebody who just received a bone marrow transplant and we're asked, is this a drug reaction or is it GVHD? Um, and unfortunately, our answer is yes. <laughs> it is a drug reaction or GVHD. Uh, or graft versus host disease, it's not something you can easily tease out. And I'll explain that a little bit. So a drug reaction usually starts one to two weeks after starting a drug. And usually around the time of bone marrow transplant, patients are exposed to a lot of different or new medications. GVHD is usually around the same time frame, actually, after the transplant. Both may have a fever. Both, and, and we're often asked about biopsying it. The biopsy is usually not helpful with acute GVHD versus a drug reaction. They have so many overlapping features. It shows what's called an interface dermatitis. So 
I am aware that the criteria for diagnosing GVHD includes a biopsy supporting that. So if you just aren't sure if it's GVHD, but it's not going to distinguish between a drug reaction and GVHD. So getting a biopsy for that reason is not going to be helpful to distinguish the two. Um, there's a soft thing, which I'm not too sure of, about drug reactions usually starting being centripetal, so it goes outwards versus uh, centrifugal going inwards. GVHD tends to start on the outside and go in versus in and out, but I don't think that that's a reliable indicator because I've seen both go different directions as far as the rash where it starts and goes. Um, drug reaction, eosinophilia can be a soft uh, way to distinguish it too if they have a high eosinophil count versus uh, GVHD. Uh, one of the biggest things to support GVHD is if they have other visceral involvement, so have bad diarrhea or liver involvement. Um, I would say that would be a little more supportive. Um, once again, DRESS syndrome can have multi-system involvement, so it's not a slam dunk, um, but DRESS syndrome is quite uncommon. And if they've had a recent graft and have all these uh, visceral involvement, potentially GVHD, uh, I'd be more certain that that would be the case over a drug reaction. All right, so one other case that I just wanted to slowly go through. So you see this patient, a 66-year-old man complaining of a painful swollen right leg developing over the past one to two weeks. Skin on both legs have been itchy off and on with more persistent itchiness recently. His temperature is low grade, 100.3, other vitals within normal limits. You've got pitting edema on both legs, but more pronounced on the right. Skin is slightly more warm to touch on the right. Medical history includes diabetes, hypertension, CVD with stenting a couple of years ago, a right hip replacement one year ago, and a 20 pack year history of smoking. So what might you be concerned about in this situation? This, is, this can be tricky. Yeah, so the, the hard distinguisher is, is this stasis dermatitis or is it cellulitis? Um, and studies show, and my experience in, seems to indicate that um, outside of dermatology, a diagnosis of cellulitis is given more frequently. Um, and I would want to discuss about cellulitis versus what is called pseudocellulitis which stasis dermatitis is one of those things. But as you can see, um, both are pretty much clinical diagnoses, um, but cellulitis should only be determined after you've excluded other possible things that could look similar. Stasis dermatitis is probably the most common, but I've also seen instances where contact dermatitis is misdiagnosed as cellulitis. Those can be pretty rip-roaring, red, painful legs as well. Um, even some cases of tinea pedis, drug eruption, et cetera. You can read all those. Um, and I'm just going to review a study. So a recent multi-institutional study, oh, sorry. If it's bilateral, strongly consider stasis dermatitis. Don't diagnose cellulitis if it's bilateral. Um, but in a multi-institutional study that reviewed 1,430 inpatient dermatology consultations, at academic institutions, they found 74 consults that were for cellulitis, and 55 of those were determined to have a diagnosis of pseudocellulitis rather than true cellulitis. I, this is in an academic center. There's going to be some inherent biases and um, confounders in this type of a study, but it seems to suggest that even up to 75% of patients who would be admitted to the hospital for cellulitis actually don't have cellulitis, don't need to be on antibiotics, um, could be managed in an outpatient setting. This is a, a big potential practice gap that could save the healthcare system a lot of money. Um, so I would just highly uh, suggest that when you're diagnosing cellulitis and admitting for cellulitis to really take a, take a step back, make sure that everything fits best with cellulitis and not something else before you admit that patient and put them on the antibiotics. Um, the other difficult thing is that leukocytosis, wound cultures, and blood cultures are actually pretty unreliable indicators. The incidence of those things happening in cellulitis versus not cellulitis are pretty close to the same. 
And so you can't hang your hat on, well, I swabbed the skin and it grew something. So that must be cellulitis. Um, the lower legs are notorious for having positive cultures. And I'm, I, I know our infectious disease colleagues would back us up on that, having positive cultures that aren't clinically significant in that way. So some thoughts I would ask you to consider before making that diagnosis of cellulitis. First of all, is it bilateral? If it is, de highly think of something else besides cellulitis. Um, any surgeries or injuries involved to the unilateral extremity? This is one I catch oftentimes with a patient who's like, it's just on my right leg. Have you had any surgeries or injuries? Oh yeah, well, I had my knee replaced or I had veins stripped or I had like a, a uh, bypass procedure or I got in a car accident and injured that leg in that or had a bike wreck and injured the leg. If there's any history of injury, that's gonna disrupt your venous flow, make it more likely to have dependent edema in that extremity and therefore stasis dermatitis just in the one side versus the other. So unilateral does not equal cellulitis. Um, you still have to delve deeper to see if that's the case. Um, rash with angulated borders would uh, favor a contact dermatitis. So if there's a sharp cut off, it looks like someone just laid a gauze pad on there and it has a rash in that kind of an angulated or geometric shape. Um, probably not cellulitis. It's probably closer to contact dermatitis. That would raise my uh, suspicions of that. If there's a lot of excoriations on there, even if they say this really hurts, it's going to hurt because it's swollen. Um, but if there's a lot of excoriations, that means it also itches, even if the patient doesn't say it itches a lot and they're scratching at it. Um, so if you see excoriations, think dermatitic process rather than cellulitic uh, or infection. And then if there's scaling, um, that also somewhat favors a dermatitic process in my or inflamed skin, but you'll see that in infection too. Is the rash limited to areas over varicosities? I also see this. So you have a cluster of obvious varicose veins and the rash is just around that area, that's quite typical for stasis dermatitis. And you can even have focal stasis dermatitis based on that with focal stasis in that area of skin. So think about that as well. Finally, if there's sclerotic chin, skin changes, so we talk about an inverted champagne bottle, if they have a lot of tightness of the skin down low near their ankle, there's a condition called lipodermatosclerosis, which um, it looks really red and angry at times, especially when it's flared and swollen. Um, but it's not infected. It's it's a component. It's like a subset of changes that can happen with stasis dermatitis. Um, and then finally, purpura. And I'll give you an example of what that looks like. Um, so kind of non-blanchable. What, what's happening here is red blood cells are extravasating, so le leaking out of the capillaries in the surface of the skin um, due to inflammation in those capillaries. So if you see that, that's not. Uh, necessarily an indication of infection. It's seen a lot of times with inflammation from venous stasis as well and other things. And in that vein, um, I wanted to, so one condition we think about with purpura is leukocytoclastic vasculitis. This is very typical on the lower legs of patients. Um, it is not a disease, but rather a reaction pattern that we see in several conditions. So most commonly we see it as a response, uh, immune response to infection or a drug reaction. So what will happen, your body will make immune complexes around whatever the organism is or the medications reacting to, and those immune complexes get into the capillaries and cause the capillaries to be inflamed and leak blood. And then you see these purpuric macules or papules because you get some palpable purpur as well. They don't always have to be palpable. If they look like this, then that I would call purpura or purpuric. Um, Usually these things are self-limited, will resolve. You always have to consider and think about a condition called henoch schonlein purpura though, um, which you see leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but it can also affect organs like your liver and your kidneys most importantly, because it can cause irreversible kidney damage. Um, and one diamond in that regard, if the leukocytoclastic vasculitis extends from the lower legs up onto the abdomen, um, for some reason, that seems to pretend a more likely diagnosis of HSP. Um, you also get abdominal pain commonly, sometimes some GI symptoms. Um, the way to diagnose and, and confirm HSP or henoch schonlein purpura is to do a punch biopsy. 
on the edge of one of these lesions, so like right next to the edge of the, one of those lesions, and it would need to be sent for direct immunofluorescence. Um, and they're looking for IgA deposition around the vessels in those capillaries on that skin sample. But that can be helpful in diagnosing henox shonline purpura if that's suspected. All right. And then as far as looking at other leg issues, um, there's a condition called pyoderma gangrenosum. Um, it can have very different appearances, as you can see, but one unifying feature, it often starts as almost like a, a bug bite-like look that just goes bad quickly. Um, and then it has this very sharp, demarcated, undermined border with granulation tissue going crazy in the base. Um, but it can look like a very chronic wound. And one of the differentials is a chronic venous stasis ulcer or other kind of chronic ulcer um, that's not healing on the lower leg. The important reason to think about pyoderma gangrenosum, though, is because you don't want to debride these wounds. Pyoderma gangrenosum exhibits a, a phenomenon called pathergy, which means wherever you have an injury, the condition manifests itself. Psoriasis is another one that has a pathergic response. You injure yourself and you have psoriasis, you're likely to get that flaring right there. Pyoderma gangrenosum is another one of those things. So the more you debride this, the more you're instigating worsening of the condition. So that's one thing that I've seen that try not to do. Um, so just to re review, there's a, there is a systemic association with pyoderma gangrenosum, particularly inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, some leukemias. Um, it is a diagnosis of inc uh, exclusion. Um, oftentimes you'll culture colonizing organisms. Once again, wound cultures are not diagnostic in this case, but they can help guide whether or not this is becoming secondarily infected. Um, it's, it's a sterile ulcer by definition, so it's not infectious ulcer. Has a neutrophil rich infiltrate. A biopsy can be helpful in ruling out things. And if it has a lot of neutrophils in it, it would support a diagnosis of pyoderma gangrenosum. Um, typically how we treat these is with either intralesional or sometimes if it's shallow enough, I can get away with topical steroids under occlusion. So a, a potent topical steroid like clobetazole, even occluded to make it more potent, um, can sometimes nip these in the bud. Oftentimes we have to inject triamcinolone in those areas in severe cases where they're not responding to those conservative measures, sometimes systemic immunosuppression with like a, a TNF inhibitor or, um, Cyclosporin has been used successfully in these cases. And then I'm going to more quickly go through some other systemic diseases that have skin findings. Um, there's quite a bit of overlap between connective tissue diseases, so rheumatologic diseases and skin findings. And then there's a host of genetic diseases uh, that I'll just briefly review. So this is a patient that didn't came in not too long ago into my clinic. Um, you'll notice some puffiness there around her eyes, um, some of that rash. I want you to get, try to get a sense for the color of this rash in your head and also the distribution of this rash. So you'll see how it seems to be pretty sharply cut off along the upper chest area. That kind of deep red uh, color is very typical of this rash too and that kind of fine scaling. So if I was describing this rash, I would call it a uh, sharply demarcated, uh, scaly pink to violaceous patch um, uh, over the, the, the upper chest. And then also on the back of her neck, once again, try to really uh, burn the color of this rash into your minds. This is what I often see with connective tissue disease rashes. Um, is they have this almost pink, but a little, I said violaceous, so purplish color to them as well. Um, this is a sign that's been described in this condition called the holster sign. So actually where you'd have a holster, um, you get a rash there on the leg. And then a very characteristic thing, once again, when you're examining patients, look closely. If you look at their cuticles, if they have some of these findings, go to their cuticles. So if you look at their cuticles, there's these fine capillary loops right along the cuticles. That is very 
uh, supportive of a diagnosis of dermatomyositis. Um, so it's kind of fun to investigate those things, kind of see the color. I'm thinking connective tissue disease. Then I'm going to look at the distribution. Oh, that's kind of a sun exposed distribution. That's like where her V-neck would be. It, it'll, ex it'll expand beyond the sun exposed. So don't be like, well, it's going down under her breast and she's not exposing that. It, it, so don't hang your hat on. It has to be just where the sun touches. But generally in a sun exposed distribution, we call that the shawl sign. And then I go to look at her fingernails. She's got these. I'm like, this is dermatomyositis. So then what do you ask? If you see skin findings, ask about the muscle findings. There is a, a variant of dermatomyositis called dermatomyositis seen myositis, which is without the myositis. Um, but you need to ask about muscle findings, particularly proximal muscle weakness. So if you have a hard time reaching your hands above your head, you can even do the exam and see if they have a hard time right there. This lady that I saw, she was like, yeah, I actually can't even lift my legs up into bed at night. Um, I have to have my husband help lift my legs up into bed at night or walking upstairs, another common one too. Um, she also has, has had dysphagia, so esophageal dysmotility, and she was having a EGD that next day because she was having trouble swallowing over the past couple months too. So putting all that together, it's, it's helpful to get her on the right track. Um, and typically you're going to want to get these people into um, rheumatology. Uh, I did do a biopsy, which would show an interface dermatitis, which you'd see with connective tissue disease as well. Couple other things that remember: you need to screen for associated malignancy, breast, ovary, lung, colorectal, most common. Sorry, and then you can get calcium deposits in the tissue. So you feel a little firm bumps. Don't get too crazy, uh, too excited about that. Um, and then it can be associated with interstitial lung disease, especially in younger patients. Um, so older patients think I got to make sure they don't have a cancer somewhere. Younger patients think. I got to check their lungs at least at baseline so we have a comparison in case they're having difficulty breathing so we can document progressive interstitial lung disease. All right, I'm just going to quickly go over these. One of our staff at, in our dermatology department has a child with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So I did want to give a call out to be, have this on your radar. Um, it has implications with family planning as far as um, genetic counseling as well as um, just being aware for things like sports where dislocations or, or bruising or, or scarring are going to be more common. Um, so it's good to pick it up if you can. So there's a lot of types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. It's, uh, it's caused by mutations in different collagen structures. Um, some signs to look for, if someone can, this is called Gorlin sign, if someone can touch the tongue to the tip of their nose, um, that's uh, widely seen in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome versus the normal population, atrophic or widened scarring, um, easy scarring, bruising, <coughs> frequent dis dislocations of joints, um, stretchy skin, hypermobile joints, um, so double-jointed people. There's quite the spectrum as well. So um, just have it on your radar. Um, and usually this needs to be teased out with a genetics consultation. Um, if there's concerns. Neurofibromatosis type one is another one that you'll see on the skin. Look for these cafe au lait macules, but if you see one, that's actually quite common. So don't get alarmed if you see one. If you see six or more, then that's a little more concerning. Then you get axillary freckling, inguinal freckling, neurofibromas. So you can you don't have to be covered in them when you have neurofibromatosis. So there, there could be fewer than, than these, but these kind of rubbery nodules is how I would describe these on the skin. Um, schwannomas, plexiform, uh, neurofibromas. So there, it's associated with learning difficulties. It's not a very common genetic condition. A lot of these skin genetic conditions aren't, but just have it on your radar, especially if there's a, a less obvious form where they just have, say, eight of these and some axillary inguinal freckling and maybe a couple of these. Something to to refer. It's an autosomal dominant condition. It's good to get it diagnosed so that they can know what's going on and evaluate for other things. Um, treating skin cancer oftentimes, if I ever have a sebaceous carcinoma come across my desk, my first thought is this patient needs to be worked up for Muir-Torre syndrome. Um, 
So if you biopsy a sebaceous adenoma or carcinoma, um, sebaceous neoplasms are highly uh, related to Muir-Torre syndrome, which the reason is that it's part of the HNPCC group of diagnoses, so it's very much related to colon cancer, um, as well as some GU malignancies as well. Um, so important to at least have them screened if they are, have a diagnosis of a sebaceous neoplasm. This is what a sebaceous adenoma often would look like. Sebaceous carcinomas are very commonly diagnosed around the eye. But they can be elsewhere. All right, now on the concept of dermatitis. So when people say they have eczema, um, usually the way we think about eczema in dermatology is atopic dermatitis. Um, but usually when people say I have eczema, they have a form of dermatitis, which you can see the list. I didn't include even everything on the list, but it just means inflamed skin, right? If you break it down in the Latin terms, dermatitis. Um, atopic dermatitis is one form. You also have irritant contact dermatitis, so irritation from chemicals or other substances, allergic contact, so like nickel allergies or that poison ivy prototypical reaction. Then you even have other things, seborrheic dermatitis. We talked about stasis dermatitis. Psoriasis, I would put in a concept, a category of dermatitis, and then even reactive, so inflamed skin due to an infection or some other kind of exposure. Atopic, atopic dermatitis is usually in the flexures, starts, it's the worst when you're a baby, and then it gets better as you grow older. I tell people most people grow out of it by the time they enter grade school. Um, there is a subset of adults who still deal with bad atopic dermatitis. Usually, if someone had atopic dermatitis as a child, they'll have problems with hand dermatitis as an adult. So, um, and then it's often associated with seasonal allergies and asthma as well. We call it the atopic triad. Um, and then you have seborrheic dermatitis. What I've highlighted here are the seborrheic areas of skin. Those are areas that have high concentrations of oil glands in the skin. We don't know why people get flares of this. There seems to be some kind of a yeast component because antifungal azol creams seem to help prevent flares from happening, um, but it typically affects this skin near the nose and the eyebrows, dandruff around the ears. Um, that's in that category of seborrheic dermatitis. So when we're thinking about treatment of dermatitis, our number one go-to is usually topical corticosteroids. Um, and then if those aren't seeming to be enough on their own, we can add a topical calcineurin inhibitor so we're not having to chronically use the topical steroids and run into side effects there. So that would be like tacrolimus or pimecrolimus. They're commonly known as elidil or protopic. Um, the next line of therapy we think about is light therapy. We have a light booth in our clinic that people can, if they have widespread uncontrolled dermatitis, instead of immunosuppressing them all the way, sometimes light therapy is enough. Um, and then the final go-to would be to systemically immunosuppress them if we can't get them under control. How to use topical steroids. This is another thing that often comes up um, outside dermatology. First of all, don't be afraid of them. Don't tell people that their skin is going to shrink away and shrivel away if they use it too much, because I find that a lot of patients get scared by that and then they don't use it enough and so that their skin doesn't get better. So. Um, you're not gonna do damage quickly with topical steroids. Yes, if you tell them go willy-nilly for the next and don't see them for six months, then yeah, they may have quite a bit of atrophy and stria from, from using them, but hopefully you're seeing them back to see if the treatment works and then you can make adjustments there if they tell you, oh, I've been using this three times a day every day since I last saw you. Um, it's best applied on damp skin. That's gonna allow the, pen, the medicine to penetrate best. So if right after the bath or shower, um, try to use lower potency steroids on the face, armpits, and groin. Use higher potency on the hands and feet, mid potency elsewhere. I'll give you examples of what those mean. I usually tell people long-term application should go, occur no more than half the days of any given month. So um, every other day, one week on, one week off, two weeks on, two weeks off. Try to get shoot for half the days of the month. If you're using it more than that, I'll have them let me know, and then I'll use a calcineurin inhibitor on those other days that they still feel like they need something. So there are so many topical steroids out there. I try to break it down easy for you. These are my go-tos. They're all generic. Um, for some reason, generic clobetazole, the price has been shooting up, as is the case with a lot of medications nowadays. So now I'm shifting over to using halobetazole because it seems to be more reasonable priced. Um, but 
I would choose something. You don't need to like look at differences between other ones. So hydrocortisone, two and a half percent or desonide is a good low potency. That's the face, armpits, groin. If you have a rash there, seborrheic dermatitis, um, other dermatitis in those areas. Once again, the medium potency topical steroid, I use triamcinolone 0.1%. Um, and that would be for the body, arms, legs, that type of thing. And if you're on the hands and feet, high potency topical steroid, augmented beta methazone is probably going to be your cheapest option. Um, although I don't feel it's quite as potent as clobetazole or halobetazole. So my first go-to is usually either clobetazole or halobetazole. As a general rule, ointments are gonna penetrate better and be more effective than creams, which are more effective than lotions. So if you can get people to tolerate a greasy ointment, that's gonna be better. Or if the rash seems really bad, you're like, can I give you an ointment to begin with? And then cream would be the next best. I'd stay away from the lotions. All right, um, real quick, an adult male with a rash on his scrotum or groin, not responsive to over-the-counter topical antifungal cream. What do you do? Treat it with more antifungals? No, biopsy it. Um, so Paget's, extra mammary Paget's disease is something that um, it often takes people a while to get to us in dermatology. They've been trying to treat this with jockage stuff for two years before we see them. And they're like, ah, and this can be quite infiltrate or expansive. It doesn't go deeply usually, but it can be quite wide areas of expansion. So don't give them a long time trying antifungals. If it's festering and not responding to antifungals within a couple months, don't be afraid to take a little biopsy of that. Um, and it can save them hopefully some uh, deforming surgeries. It's an uncommon skin cancer, but it often appears around the genitals, anus, perineum, or groin or axilla. And it can be associated once again with an underlying GI or GU malignancy. There's certain staining patterns pathologically that might indicate that but it's probably good if they if it's appropriate to screen them for colon cancer or G, GU malignancy. We often have to do scouting biopsies around the edge because that can extend quite a bit beyond. So this could definitely be involved all the way in this, what appears to be normal skin um, all around the area. So we often do scouting biopsies to try to get the extent of things. All right, last final stretch. Now we're going even faster, <clears throat> but you have these in your notes. Acne. I'm not going to review all these treatments, but this is what I would do if people have these types of acne. Warts. Don't use over-the-counter wart freezers. They don't get cold enough to really kill off the skin well enough for the warts. I would consider if you're interested, and hopefully some of you are because it's hard to get people into dermatology, um, if it's not responding to freezing, and a good adjunct, and especially if it's periungual or if they have a lot of warts, um, consider injecting this candida antigen in. Um, it's an immunotherapy. It stimulates the immune system to attack the wart virus. And it doesn't work better than other wart treatments, but it works differently. And it can work for things that don't respond to the destructive treatment. So you inject it into the base of your biggest wart or the wart and kind of in the middle of the area of warts, um, about 0.2 milliliters injected into there. You repeat that every four weeks. Give it a few times. If your wart keeps shrinking, keep doing it until it's gone. Um, if it doesn't seem to be working, then go to the next thing. That's how we, we do it. All of these treatments, you can have them at home apply that 40% salicylic acid for. Just reiterate one more time, look at your patient's skin, have them take their shirt off. Um, look at their back areas that they can't see. It can oftentimes catch things that they don't have. Um, when in doubt, refer or biopsy. That's, I tried to think of getting the distinguishing characteristics between, between certain things, but when it comes to it, oftentimes there's, uh, there's too many subtle things and we have a gestalt reaction that we just, we've seen so much skin in dermatology that we can distinguish those things. If a skin lesion does seem pasted on the skin though, has a waxy surface, it's probably a seborrheic keratosis though. So just don't get too concerned, even though that's dark brown and kind of sticks out that's a seborrheic keratosis. You've heard about the ABCDs, so my time is up and I will go with questions. You can ask about dermatology, things that weren't in my presentation too. I'm going through everything, it's hard to pick what to talk about, but. <laughs> 
you are all now experts in dermatology.